Okay. Good morning and good evening, members and friends. Welcome to CCBC Practical Tool webinar series. Uh, I'm truly happy to see so many familiar names and, uh, and in, in the room. Uh, we hope that you and your family members are well during this time of trouble. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is uh, Edward Tai, CCBC's chapter director in Shanghai. Now today, we're much honored to have uh, two seasoned China-based executives in the commercial property sector to discuss the best reopened practice for shopping centers and office buildings in China. Now, before we commence today's session, I would like to take the chance to thank our sponsor, China Mobile International, for great generous support. And we will hear from Helena Hao, Director, China Mobile Canada, towards the end of the session. Now, in order to have everybody hear the discussion clearly, we choose to un only unmute the panelists and moderator during the event. However, questions are much encouraged, welcomed, and appreciated. Please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen to send your questions. We will address them as many as we could, and would provide feedback and answers to those unattended questions through emails if they, are on, they aren't addressed due, due to the shortage of time. Uh, please note this session is recorded. Without further ado, I would like to call Ms. Sarah Kudlagus, CCBC's Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer to moderate the panel. So Sarah, over to you. Thank you, Edward. Uh, and thanks for bringing us two very experienced people from Shanghai today for this panel. Uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that joining our program today, I'm not sure if he's on yet, is Saad Rafi, Chief of the City of Toronto's Office of Recovery and Rebuild. So there's definitely an interest from cities uh, in learning from this. And uh, when we hosted Mayor John Tory a couple weeks ago, he mentioned that Saad would definitely be interested in this topic. So we're happy he's joining us and hope that Toronto will reopen as successfully as Shanghai has. So our two panelists today are Fanny Lung, Senior Managing Director for Marketing and Center Management at Chongbang, a real estate and development group in the Yangtze River Delta that has a long relationship with Ivanhoe Cambridge in Montreal, so a good Canadian connection. And Stuart Mercier, uh, who's Managing Director, Real Estate and Country Head for China at Brookfield Asset Management. Stuart directs Brookfield's real estate activities across Asia and is our newest member of CCBC's Board of Directors. So I'm gonna ask both panelists to introduce themselves by telling us about the footprint that they have in China, the types of buildings, and how the onset of COVID-19 affected your operations. So what was it like when things shut, uh, shut down and did they shut down? So why don't we start with Fanny? Hi, good morning, everybody. Yeah, I'm Fanny. Um, well, we are operating uh, four shopping malls uh, in Shanghai. Actually, they are all mixed-use developments. And then we also have one in Suzhou and also one in Hangzhou. So during the COVID-19 uh, uh, event or the incident, uh, our mall actually uh, is keep on operating. Yeah, because uh, basically in Shanghai, um, the situation is still under control. So the government uh, would like us to keep uh, all the shopping mall open as far as we can. That's why we didn't uh, actually close uh, at all. And uh, by the time when the government saying that, okay, you're ready, you are uh, resume. So what we do is actually the most important part is uh, let the customer knowing that they are in a safe place. So, of course, we do a lot of uh, sanitar sanitization, uh, you know, procedure and also uh, doing, uh, you know, of course, everybody have to wear wearing a face mask uh, and everybody come in to do the temperature reading. I think uh, it will always also be happening in Canada as well. I think one thing what we did is um, we because uh, all our shopping malls, uh, you know, we have a lot of open space. It is a type of like a life hub. So we organize uh, quite a series of the uh, sports related activities so that people would like to come out. Uh, at least they would like to come out, you know, to, to exercise a bit uh, while they, they walk around. Uh, and also, of course, we provide a lot of uh, sales promotion 
uh, for restaurants. Yeah, so for, uh, and I think uh, particularly uh, those restaurants which will be patronized by the younger people. Yeah, so that is what, uh, well, we can share it a bit later on. Yeah, I think so far uh, it took us almost like uh, four weeks before the business are back to uh, normal. Uh, normal in a sense, uh, in terms of apparel sales, I think the sportswear uh, rented number one. Uh, while the formal wear and the shoes, they are actually ticking up almost like uh, six to eight weeks time before they are all back to normal. Yeah, because everybody works from home, so they don't need uh, beautiful shoes, wear, uh, you know, formal wear. <laughs> uh, they, they're not buying all these. Uh, in terms of uh, food restaurants, as long as your restaurant is serving beef, uh, people all love to eat it because uh, it was uh, being sort of like endorsed by the doctors in Shanghai. We should eat more beef. So that's why we have beef hot pork, uh, the, all the steakhouse, they are operating under a very good business. Yeah. So maybe I turn it to Stuart. Hopefully some of that was Canadian beef. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sarah and uh, and Fanny. Thank you. Um, obviously, it's a great pleasure to be here with everyone this morning uh, and to support CCBC in, in spreading some of the lessons that, that we've learned here in this part of the world for uh, the benefit of you know our Canadian colleagues and, and compatriots back home. Um, you know, I'd, I'd echo the comments that that Fanny made. I, I think one of the key differentiators um, between China. Uh, and Canada is that the government really took the approach over here to focus on uh, the operators, the tenants themselves, as opposed to the, the retail and office um, operators in terms of uh, closing down specific properties. And so from Brookfield's perspective, um, that meant that our portfolio of office, of retail uh, in China and Korea remained open throughout uh, the whole COVID crisis from January onwards. And so, you know, it meant that we were heavily focused on uh, ensuring the safety and well-being of our employees who had to continue to uh, operate the properties for the benefits of our customers and our tenants during that period of time, uh, as well as, uh, frankly, learn as we went. Um, you know, there was no guidebook, no instruction manual uh, from which to operate. And so this was you know, really an exercise in supporting our folks here and, and leveraging the broader Brookfield business globally for, uh, you know, the benefit of our team. And so during the initial days, for example, that involved shipping PP&E from uh, our business elsewhere in the world for the benefit of our Chinese employees who were in need. And then certainly over the course of February and March, um, as you can imagine, that flow shifted where it became our uh, Chinese colleagues and businesses here really helping to support the needs of Brookfield's businesses elsewhere in the world. Um, you know, I think over the last number of weeks, what we've seen in particular is a real resurgence in consumer confidence. Uh, people, to Fanny's point, are returning to the shopping malls, they're returning to the restaurants, they're returning to the stores, they're returning to their office. Uh, and what has made that possible has been a, a real combination of, uh, you know, of events. The first is you know, very active engagement from the government here in China and, and frankly as well in Korea uh, to really test uh, and ensure that there is decent uh, contact tracing in place so that the level of new infections has continued to decline. And so in addition to that sort of reality being in place, equally as important has been the perception. And so uh, as, a, as a retail and office operator like ourselves, that means ensuring that when people enter our properties, they feel like they're entering a safe space. And so uh, that's you know, required us really to ensure that we're over communicating uh, with everyone that steps foot on our properties. There's lots of additional signage. Uh, that speaks to all of the specific safety measures that we've you know, put in place. There's lots of hand sanitizer uh, when people are entering properties. Uh, here in China, it was also a requirement that we had uh, thermal scanners. And so we checked everybody's temperature as they were entering the properties. And so certainly, you know, subsequent uh, now, there's been you know, varying degrees of, uh, of scientific analysis that's taken place in terms of whether that's you know, really effective or not. 
Uh, but certainly from a perception perspective, people felt that once they were on the other side of that, that there was a degree of security uh, from their perspective. And again, that that has really driven consumer confidence here, which has allowed for you know, a relatively rapid rebound uh, in the economy coming out the other side of this. So, you know, our hope obviously is that that continues and that frankly, um, you know, that degree uh, of confidence continues to spread around the world, including to Canada, and, and, uh, and we see a rebound there as well. Thanks, Stuart. Now, you've, you've touched on some of these safety measures, and um, we know that uh, in order to get back to normal, people need to both be safe and to feel safe. So there's physical and psychological measures involved. Um, uh, maybe Fanny can talk a bit about what you've done in your facilities in that regard. Yeah, we actually installed the ultraviolet uh, uh, lighting to kill the germs. Uh, that will happening in our, all the toilets and also for the fresh air intake. Uh, plus, uh, we are installing the uh, sort of like the, uh, the also the uh, ultraviolet, uh, you know, the equipment for all the escalators. I mean, for all the escalator, because you normally you will be touching the handrail for most of the time. Uh, so these are uh, what we feel is so the people will feel a lot more confidence. And, uh, and of course, uh, in the lift, uh, we are also installing uh, those uh, mats, uh, which uh, sort of like changing it uh, every hour. Uh, so that uh, when the people are coming in, so they are being sort of like walked through uh, some, uh, you know, uh, disinfection uh, uh, fluid will be put it on, on the floor. Yeah. So I think mm -hmm. we are doing uh, all sorts of, um, uh, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, sanitization measure. Uh, so as the, the people, as like what uh, Stuart said, it has to be seen. And of course, communicating to the uh, shoppers, you know, how you're going to keep the area safe uh, for them while when they're coming in, do the shopping. So all the, uh, of course, all the staff, we announce it uh, that all staff, uh, they will be taking the temperature and everybody in the mall, even for the, uh, even for the staff of the retailer or the restaurant, they have to be under 14 days quarantine before they come back to work. Yeah, so that uh, we have to try to really ensuring that uh, everybody in the mall, uh, they are safe in that respect. And is that quarantine when entering the Shanghai municipality? Uh, no, even actually at that time, let's say we open the mall on February the 10th. So the, the mandatory quarantine actually only happened in April. So, uh, but mm -hmm. for us, uh, for all the staff, uh, you know, all our own staff, plus uh, the staff of the restaurant or the retailer, we check uh, and ask where they were, even if they are away from Shanghai, let's say they're coming back from Beijing or where, wherever. So we have to ensure that they have to declare that they have been live in Shanghai for the past 14 days before we allow them to come back to work. Okay. It's important, yeah. Now, Stuart, uh, some of what Fanny has talked about involves a lot of people doing a lot of disinfecting. Um, you know, you have facilities in Canada as well. In terms of sort of the labor force, are Canadian office buildings and shopping centers staffed up to do that or will they need to bring in extra labor? You know, it's a good question. And, and so, Sarah, I'd say first and foremost, what we've done everywhere around the world is follow the best advice of the local health authorities, where uh, each market is different, the risk is different, and the recommended actions are different. So, uh, you know, that that's really been the guiding principle from our perspective. Um, and yet at the same time, ensure that, you know, all of our uh, properties across the world can take advantage of the best practices and, and the lessons that we've experienced elsewhere. And so, uh, you know, this has really been an exercise for us where uh, there are opportunities to learn from th some of the things that we've done in Asia for the benefit of our properties uh, in North America. And so that's, uh, you know, that's certainly been the case. I think, um, you know, from a cleaning perspective, some of the things that uh, Fanny mentioned, 
um, you know, have been done uh, manually in, in Asia, and yet we've uh, found automated solutions uh, that will work well in our properties in North America. So, mm. for example, one of the things that we're uh, investigating is uh, UV light devices that get attached to uh, escalator handrails. And so it's a sort of constant cleaning exercise where over here that might be a staff member um, you know, with uh, cleaning supplies doing it themselves, whereas in North America, we have the ability to sort of turn to, uh, you know, an automated solution. That makes sense. Now, you know, one of the other things that uh, I didn't understand was different, but from the way you two have described it, I suspect is, is, you know, here in Canada, we're talking about reopening in phases, you know, moving from phase mm -hmm. one to phase two, to phase three. Were there these different phases of the COVID crisis in China? especially in terms of reopening? Well, uh, actually, it's, we all act under the uh, guidance of the government. So, of course, the government closed the cinema. Uh, all the children educational institution are being uh, mandatory. It's under the, uh, they have to be closed. So the government, uh, actually, uh, they get it reopened. First of all, it's the retail, uh, the restaurants. Uh, they all can be open at the same time. Uh, then followed by uh, the entertainment facilities like KTV uh, and the children's, uh, you know, the fun, fun park. I think we just got recently within this week, uh, all the children educational uh, facilities uh, can be reopened. So we reckon the cinema looks like uh, will be by middle of June. So in fact, the government is also opening up in phases. Uh, I think that is really quite a good practice when we look back because otherwise it can be quite scary because if anything happened, uh, we may face uh, the potential event that we have to close up if there is any case uh, happening in a mall. So that's why we also have to be really extra, uh, you know, be careful about the entire uh, resumption arrangement. Well, and I, one of the interesting things I find about Chinese shopping malls is if, if you go to any mall on a Sunday or Saturday afternoon, there are entire floors of these malls dedicated to keeping small children happy. Uh, and uh, Fanny, you mentioned some of those facilities. Are, are parents comfortable bringing their kids in? And are, are, there, you know, are, are they distancing? What are, what are the changes between the sort of crazy weekend environment that might have existed? Uh, I think we only see that we start seeing the crazy weekend is actually for the during the May holiday. We're starting from, uh, you know, the May 1st to May 5th. There is a five days uh, May holidays. It's a Labor Day holidays. Uh, and then followed by Mother's Day and then the Children International Days. So actually it took us, uh, we're seeing that uh, it take almost like two months the parents are willing to bring the kids out. Mm. So that's why uh, I think even the children facilities are uh, open. Uh, honestly, there's limited uh, business for almost like close to about two months time. Okay. So you will only be seeing a lot of younger people, uh, you know, like uh, university uh, students, uh, you know, those between 15 to 20. Uh, or the 25, yeah, around that age, they all coming out. Stuart, did so, you see the same trends in your, oh, sorry. No, so that one, I'm not sure, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Similar yeah, experience sir, to you, sir? We, uh, we did. I mean, I, I think it's, it's really an exercise in the study of human nature, where, you know, there are some folks who hit that point of inflection in relation to cabin fever uh, earlier than others. And, um, and so, you know, those groups are the ones that return earliest, uh, you know, they're out for the first meal with their friends uh, that they haven't seen in a while. And then uh, as people reach a point of increasing comfort that, you know, the number of cases, the risk of infection has gone down, they're, they're willing to return to more aspects of their daily and regular life. And one of those things, of course, is, you know, spending time with your family out at the shopping mall uh, on the weekends, where, you know, in Asia in particular, and, and certainly here in China, um, you know, the, the shopping mall is really an extension of the family living room. You know, you're more inclined uh, to spend the whole day there involved in a meal, uh, a movie, taking your kids to their tutor or an art class in the shopping mall during the course of the day, uh, 
um, you know, a number of aspects that, you know, aren't as common in the Western tenant mix that we see in U.S. and Canadian shopping malls. And, uh, and so now that, you know, really the, the level of risk and frankly, the perception of risk has gone down, uh, we're seeing families return, traffic pick up and, and more of those aspects coming back to normal. And are there distancing measures put in place? You know, are restaurants having to keep tables empty or space people in certain ways? Or is it fairly similar to before? Uh, the yeah. government only, yeah. Uh, I think the, the requirement only lasts for like about three weeks time. Uh, and then the things are actually back to normal. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, there was some mention about promotional campaigns to get people back to shopping centers. So what, what sort of promotion was done to bring traffic in? Well, we actually organizing, uh, since uh, for all our life hubs, we have a lot of open spaces. So that's why we, uh, the first of the whole theme from March to uh, until August is all sorts of spots uh, you can name of. Yeah. And then we also uh, have uh, some installation uh, in the open air. Yeah, so that they can, uh, they have a theme, aqua, wave, so that for kids to really run around uh, and uh, so that they can do exercise. Uh, we have yoga classes uh, at the rooftop or, and then we have um, uh, those, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, roping, uh, jumping rope, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then whatever you can think of uh, or the racing. The racing cost because uh, they can race along you know some open area so i think the people like to come out and um, so exercise is one of the, uh, the the most important theme in terms of sales promotion of course uh, you have to give them the like spot purchase uh, you you pay about something like 69 dollars then you can get a coupon worth a hundred so in essence we are giving them uh, some sales promotional support to our tenant so that uh, we can uh, attract more people coming back to the mall. Stuart, did you get, have you done anything different? No, very similar. And, and I think, you know, one of the, uh, one of the interesting things from a, a macro perspective that we're seeing over here is of course the, you know, the Chinese government has been very focused on restarting, uh, you know, the domestic consumption element of the Chinese economy. Um, and very conscious of the fact that, you know, what will work this time uh, is not what worked for them coming out of the global financial crisis, which was, you know, heavy sort of infrastructure led investment, um, you know, that led to, you know, frankly, a decade of, of debt level concerns. And so as a result, uh, you know, this time around, they've been focused on finding ways to innovate and really you know, restart, as I said, that, that level of the economy that has traditionally sat outside of their um, levers of macro policy. And so this is, you know, finding ways to support small and medium businesses, uh, many of which find themselves in the services sector, uh, again, many of which are our tenants, and equally ensuring that people feel comfortable to go back out and spend in these locations. And so one of the big programs that they've been rolling out is you know, providing spending vouchers to consumers to incent them to go back out. To Fanny's point, you know, providing them with a, you know, a time sensitive deal uh, that gets them out of their own living room and, and into ours, uh, driving traffic, driving sales, and really, you know, trying to restart that, uh, that key component of the Chinese economy. And how are your tenants' financial situations? I know here, you know, on some streets you go and you see a lot of, um, uh, a, a lot of stores shuttered because those small owners are, are having trouble getting, you know, keeping things going. What are you finding in China? Well, actually for us, uh, when the, once when we get back to, uh, at the more, uh, back to normal operation, uh, we have no choice, but uh, we did uh, giving them some uh, rental support. We did not charge anything for the entire month of February. So it is all three. Yeah. Because although we uh, open on the 10th of February, but frankly speaking, for that particular two weeks time, uh, very, very limited traffic is happening. It's only the uh, takeaway service is having some business. So that's why uh, we decided to make it like zero rental for the entire month of February. 
And then for March, uh, we work on the turnover rental basis. So uh, we, because most of our contract, we do have a turnover percentage. So that's why we waive the base rental and then we only get the turnover rent, whatever they, whatever uh, sales turnover they have, we take the percentage per contractual terms. Mm -hmm. And then for April uh, onwards, if they do have problems, uh, then we can talk uh, on individual basis. And then we do uh, view it if they do have the capability to uh, still continue to operate, then we would be able to uh, sort of like giving them the uh, deferred payment scheme. So, but of which uh, they will be only be deferring the payment for about maximum two to three months only, because otherwise uh, we do not want to drag on for too long. Yeah. I see. Stuart, have you had, have you seen closures in your facilities, or are people hanging in? We have, but but minimal. And, and I'd say uh, the closures are now behind us. You know, to Fanny's point, as as traffic and sales have rebounded at this point, uh, you know, absent uh, additional closures that, that you know that that may come, and, and obviously we're all keen to avoid those. Um, you know, we we aren't expecting that to continue, and so you know, I think from a retail perspective. The relationship between landlords and tenants is very much a symbiotic one, uh, and we want to ensure that uh, you know that those tenants that are best positioned to come out of this, you know, have our support. And so, uh, you know, now that customers uh, are returning to the shopping malls again, we want to make sure that everybody's open for business uh, and really has the opportunity to perform coming out the other side of this. So, uh, you know, it's, it's our hope and expectation that, uh, you know, the most challenging days are behind us now that uh, customers are back and spending the properties. Okay. Uh, I'll just remind the audience that the chat function is available if you want to ask questions. So please feel free. Um, now, in addition to shopping centers, you both have office space in your facilities. And here in North America, some companies are finding that their employees are happy working from home. Um, uh, companies like Facebook have said they're planning for permanent work from home arrangements. Uh, are you seeing this in China or were people very happy to get back into the offices? Um, uh, and in, you know, in any of the countries where you operate, do you expect any changes in terms of leasing activity? I think for, for us in Shanghai, for the projects which uh, we operate, I think most of the people, they quite eager to come back to work because I think they've been staying home for almost like locked in uh, with the family uh, for almost like a, a whole month. I think they would like to get away uh, and then really seeing their friends uh, in the office. But of course, uh, we still requiring at that time for the first month, uh, everybody needs to wear the mask, even they are working uh, out from the office. Mm -hmm. uh, so that will be a little bit of a challenging. Uh, but right now, of course, uh, things are already back to normal. But I think uh, what we feel is uh, if there are co-working sort of like we work type of uh, operation, uh, they may have a little bit of a challenge at the present moment because I think uh, some people, they, uh, particularly the, uh, the technology related uh, company, that they make to a degree that they can really work out from home. But uh, all depending on type of business, I think, yeah. Stuart, what about you? You've got, a, you've got facilities in different Asian countries as well as back here. What are you seeing? Yeah, you know, look, I, I think our expectation is that uh, there will certainly be changes. Um, and there will be, you know, uh, a number of headline announcements like that of, uh, of the company that you mentioned, where you know, they will see this as an opportunity perhaps to decentralize a number of, you know, the components of their business. Uh, and for some groups that may work, um, you know, it may be possible and perhaps more efficient for some of them to work for home. Uh, you know, our experience though, is that the vast majority to Fanny's point are keen to be back in the office. That cabin fever quotient has been hit. Uh, in particular, if you're in a smaller apartment, which is much more common here in Asia, uh, you know, you're very keen to get back out to, you know, go and collaborate with your colleagues and sort of return to your daily routine. Um, and so, you know, our expectation is that really that will be the key driver. I think one of the other elements that will balance off uh, some of those corporate groups who, who may look to move some of their departments to a work from home model 
um, is that the amount of space that uh, is typically planned for on a per employee basis has really been condensed over the last decade. Um, and certainly in the social distancing environment in which we now find ourselves, uh, invariably the need for additional space per returning employee will increase. Mm. And a number of organizations are certainly uh, planning at this stage to return to a sort of A and B team model, um, where again, you know, finding a home for that B team uh, will be another key driver of space. And so, you know, net net, our expectation is that um, you know both sides of that equation uh, will move over the next little while. Uh, but we don't expect uh, you know sort of mass exodus of space. In fact, uh, you know we may actually see uh, positive absorption coming out of this. As I said, the you know the sort of per employee uh, amount of area that companies take you know reverts back to the mean. Less hoteling, perhaps. Correct. Yeah. So one of the questions that's come in is, um, you know, you've both talked about some of the measures that were taken to make it safe for both office towers and shopping centers. Um, and, uh, you know, as you said, things like temperature testing arguably may not be the most effective. Which measures do you think are the most effective ones to make reopening safe? Hmm. I think, well, first of all, I think uh, what we really can only do is, uh, First of all, we have to rely on, uh, you know, the, the government. Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, we have to uh, listen to, uh, like, uh, you know, the health authority. So if they feel it is really safe, uh, I think, uh, first of all, uh, we act according to their guidance. Uh, I think in addition to the temperature reading, honestly speaking, there's not much we can do uh, besides uh, we doing all our disinfection uh, measure. Um, wh like what I mentioned, uh, I can only control uh, the staff working in the mall. I cannot control the people coming to the mall. But uh, one thing we can uh, request is everybody coming to the mall, they have to wear the mask. So at least this is really the minimum we can uh, work on. Okay. Stuart, what, what were the most uh, effective measures in your opinion? Yeah, look, I, I'd, I'd echo Fanny's comments. I mean, I, I think uh, one of the most important things at, at this time is really to listen to, you know, the best advice, which, you know, candidly is not on uh, this video conference. You know, it's, it's the public health authorities, it's the epidemiologists who have access to the best real-time data to sort of make those decisions. Um, you know, the observation that I would make uh, from an Asian perspective relative to North America is uh, the acceptance of masks. Mm -hmm. and, and this is something that certainly uh, over here we found to be incredibly effective. And again, I'm, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, studies will ever be able to show the difference between correlation and causation um, in this regard. But, uh, you know, masks here have been ubiquitous. And, and I think one of the most important dynamics that sometimes get lost in the conversation is that those masks uh, aren't being worn to protect you from others. They're designed to protect others from you, absent uh, wholesale testing of the entire population. That, you know, there will be a percentage of folks who may not know that they're sick and therefore won't know uh, that they're potential spreaders of the virus and wearing a mask helps to reduce infection on that basis. And that's something that we've seen, uh, you know, used to ubiquity here in China and Korea. And, uh, you know, again, it, it's, it's been one of the key ingredients, I think, to success in, in the early days here. Well, and, um, you know, the mask wearing may be one of those actions that is, is easier to accept in China than it has been in uh, Canada or the U.S., are there other actions that help keep things contained that might be harder to convince Canadians to do? Even temperature sensing, are, are there anything, any things you think might be, you know, more difficult outside of China? More difficult outside of China? Mm. You know, what about the QR codes on your phones, for example, and the contact tracing? Uh, yeah, the QR code, which uh, once, well, actually, uh, I think, if it is really uh, implementing in the Western world, so they might say that it is infringe of your privacy because they do check where you have been for the past 14 mm. days, even 30 days. 
because once when you turn on, they actually monitor wherever you go. Yeah. Yeah, that one is a bit tougher. <laughs> yeah. Um, a, a couple other questions have come in. One, you talked about the voucher programs that both of your facilities have used. Is there evidence that the programs are working and getting people to spend? Yes. Because uh, the restaurant, the retailer, they're offering some uh, great discount. So what we're doing is in addition to the discount offering by our tenant, we give additional uh, goodies. So mm -hmm. I think that, that will be sort of like, because honestly speaking, we are also fighting for the shoppers getting back to our mall. So that's why we have to do our utmost to, to do the series of uh, events and promotion so that... Um, uh, and I think the most important part is uh, because we do operate uh, a, uh, like a, a membership program. So I think for all our members, so because uh, we do communicate with them uh, online with the WeChat, uh, you know, online platform. So uh, what we find is uh, when the more we open, actually your members, because they know the more, so they are your most valuable customer uh, in this type of crisis. Yeah, because they know you, they trust you, uh, uh, and then you constant communicating with them what you're doing. So to build up the confidence. So once when, uh, you know, when, when there are something, uh, you know, when you want to do some sales promotion or whatever, they do come back to the mall. So I think uh, in that respect, actually we will be further strengthen our membership program. Yeah, which is, we feel is just super, super important. And Stuart, related to that, a question came in to say, you know, so you've had more people coming through the malls. Have, has there been more retail turnover uh, following those people in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's been an interesting trend that we've seen where, uh, you know, we're, we're not back to 100% of 2019 traffic in our shopping malls. Uh, and yet the average spend of the consumer that does come back is higher than it was last wow. year. And so, wow. you know, said simply, our traffic numbers are down, but our sales numbers are down less. And actually our sales numbers are now getting to the point where, you know, a number of our retailers are actually showing, act, you know, absolute year over year growth from 2019. And I think uh, it's because the, the people that have come back initially to the, you know, to the retail properties are there for a purpose. You know, they, They've come out to buy something, to do something, and that's really driven them back in, as opposed to, you know, just uh, coming for an afternoon to walk around. Uh, okay. And you know, traditionally, those sorts of folks would uh, would have made uh, up a percentage of those in our properties. So, uh, you know, the sales productivity really has come back, and um, you know, we don't have a clear case study uh, absent the vouchers to sort of compare the two worlds against at the moment. Uh, but I would certainly uh, echo Fanny's comments in that regard that, um, you know, they have had a positive impact and, and certainly, you know, we're seeing all of this flow through retail sales at the moment, which is great. And uh, one of our audience members would like to know more specifics on the voucher from the government. So how much was it worth? And were there other incentives that the government implemented to get people back out? Mm, honestly speaking, the government saying that, uh, I think only the government give out the voucher is for uh, Hangzhou. Uh, but then it's really limited uh, number. So once when they uh, start uh, releasing it online, so you just can't get it. So only <laughs> within minutes, it's all gone. And, and how, much was, how much were those worth? I think it's something like fifty-five dollar. That once you and you get it, you can spend for a, like a hundred. Yeah. So okay. like. Uh, so yeah. that'd be about ten Canadian dollars to buy twenty Canadian dollars worth. Yeah. Of stuff. Right. Something like that. So yeah, the but, other ones you talked about in Shanghai, those were an initiative of uh, of Chongbang, for example. Yeah. So government. actually, it's only uh, for us, uh, for the uh, for the mall operator. For us, uh, we operating. Uh, let's say we do. Uh, because we do have uh, membership programs, so that's why we have redemption points. So mm. we can make use of like 10 redemption points that you can worth like 10 bucks, $10 RMB, so that they can really uh, think, oh, you, you, you better spend more and then you get more money and then in return, you can uh, have more cash coupon. Yeah, so there are all sorts of like, uh, like what I mentioned, spot purchase, uh, you know, for the... 
uh, cash coupons, uh, $69 or $79 worth for a hundred uh, uh, coupon that you can use uh, for the F&B or the retail. Or we did offer one thing we find it is quite uh, useful is you spend 200 in retail, I give you back 100 for the F&B. So ah. actually people do spend, yeah. Or, or vice versa. So you spend uh, 200 uh, in your F&B, we give you back 100. It's real cash, actually. Yeah. Interesting. But of course, we, we, we cannot do it too often because uh, it really costs us quite a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's a question I'll, 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 give, I'll post to Stuart. Um, have you installed UV cleaning equipment in your North American operations? And have you done that in commercial or retail locations? Yeah, so uh, so I can't speak to specific properties in Canada. Um, I'd say that you know in all of our facilities, you know we have sort of HEPA filters and the like installed, and and uh, and have been experimenting with different technologies in various properties. Um, you know, in our Canadian portfolio, it's primarily office as opposed to retail, and so again, that's one where we've been you know working with both uh, our consultants and uh, and our tenants to find the best solutions in all of our properties. Um, you know, this is. Uh, again, given the legacy systems that are in, in place in all of our properties across North America, you know, there's no one size fits all solution. And so we've really been working uh, with our partners and consultants to find the best solution for each one of those properties. Now, you know, the, in a, on a normal day in China, you can see line lineups for the elevators in some of the big office buildings. Um, how do you handle the rush of, uh, of people getting up when you have to distance people in the elevators or don't you do that in China? We do it, queue up. So we allow like about nine to 10 people in the lift. So of course, again, uh, you have to manually control it. Uh, I think people uh, also, they will follow because nobody would like to really jump back uh, in the lift. Yeah, so basically you better to be something like nine person in the lift. Yeah, because you make it like a, a square, nice square, which is quite easy. Yeah. Okay. Now, bringing an entire facility back online means a lot of people wearing masks and face shields. And uh, Stuart talked a little about the early days of the, you know, other countries helping China and then vice versa. Uh, what has been the experience getting reliable supplies of PPE for um for employees? And do your tenants handle that or do, um, do your companies help them? For us, uh, of course, we buy all the masks uh, for all our staff uh, and even some of the tenants, when we first uh, sort of like get the more resume operation, some of our tenants that uh, they, they, we've been asking, oh, why you're not opening the mall, uh, the shop? Because they've been telling us, oh, oh, we just don't have enough masks. Then, of course, we supply it to them because uh, to us, uh, because the government, uh, they do have uh, allowing us to do uh, bulk purchase. So we actually buy from the government uh, appointed uh, uh, supplier. So, so that's why we, we can get certain assurance, uh, uh, which is of uh, good quality. Yeah, and, and at least the price is reasonable. So for us, uh, for the first one week, I remember, actually we supplied most of the masks to all our, uh, you know, retail tenant and office uh, and the restaurant as well. Okay, and Stuart, how about for your facilities? Yeah, very similar answer. And so, you know, we, we obviously went about the exercise of uh, building up supplies for our uh, staff and operations folks and uh, tenants on the retail side uh, who needed them. You know, in, in China, uh, while we did have some masks available for folks that were coming to our properties, invariably you could sort of rely on the fact that by the time uh, they showed up, they were already wearing a mask. Mm. Um, you know, that, uh, that hasn't been the case elsewhere. And so, you know, we do have supplies on hand for folks, you know, coming into our properties who are in need of one in various locations. But again, we've been following, um, you know, local health authorities and, and their guidance around the world in that regard, in terms of whether or not masks are required or recommended in, in, in what uh, environment. And, you know, it's come up in a number of different areas here about the role of the government and, um, uh, that may be different than here in Canada. Uh, I guess, Stuart, how, how do you find communicating with the local authorities in China about reopening your business? And, you know, whether it's them giving you a government su supplier for uh, masks or 
just in terms of rules and regulations. Just give us, because the audience may not have a, a sense of how you're working with different government authorities. Give us a sense of how that worked in, uh, in China. Yeah, so it's interesting. And, and uh, you know, funnily enough, I think there are, <laughs> Uh, you know, a lot of parallels, it, you know, that, that really there is no instruction manual that came with how to deal with COVID-19. And so, uh, you know, we've seen health authorities around the world, um, you know, really get engaged. Certainly here in China, they've had a longer uh, window to do that, given, um, you know, the challenges that were faced, obviously, in January and the lockdown that, that took place here. And, and so we've really found uh, a high level of engagement with local authorities who want to be uh, helpful in terms of that reopening process and, uh, you know, and, and have been very focused on trying to balance the needs of maintaining the low infection rates and the success that's been achieved here and balancing that off with the need to get the economy restarted. Um, and, uh, and so as the balance of that shift shifted towards the economy, you know, we saw a lot of engagement, a lot of desire to be helpful uh, you know, what sort of supplies are needed, how can we help get people back into the office, um, and the like, which is, uh, you know, which has been great. And obviously now we're seeing uh, a similar exercise underway as a number of other, you know, markets around the world start their process of reopening on a phased basis. Now, a, a lot of malls um, have subway stops nearby, and I'm, I'm curious how public transportation has played a role in bringing people back to your facilities. I mean, here in Canada, people seem to seem afraid to resume taking public transit. So how has it worked on the Shanghai subway? Fanny, mm, maybe you can take this one. Uh, actually, I think uh, for the first uh, a month, I think people are driving. So even though most of people, if they are weekend driver, they start to, to really become sort of like driving, going back to work uh, by their own car. So I think that's why we're seeing uh, there the, is always a traffic jam, uh, always in the morning. Uh, I think it takes uh, almost like three months. I think gradually people now are taking the uh, metro uh, uh, line or taking the high speed train. Uh, but I think one thing good is uh, because everybody wear a mask. Uh, mm. So at least, uh, of course, you bring all your uh, disinfection, uh, you know, wipes and everything. So once when you get there, so you wipe all your seat first before you sit down. So it looks a bit weird, but I think since everybody's are doing that, so, so might as well, you better do it as well. Yeah. So I think so far, uh, like what Stuart mentioned, because of the different culture, so people taking wearing masks is protecting ourselves plus protecting the others. So people are willing to do that. And even today, uh, even uh, we are being under almost like zero infection locally for, for a number of days. But I think people, everybody is really still wearing the mask. Although the government saying that, yeah, it's really up to you. If you, you can decide it, uh, you know, by yourself. Uh, uh, if you don't want to wear the mask, uh, uh, you know, it's not a mandatory right now, but you will be seeing that uh, almost like 95% of the people in the, on the road, uh, we are still wearing masks. I mean, I'm wearing masks uh, every day when I start leaving home for my office. Well, and I sense that there's a real vigilance and people feel that this freedom they have now to go to the mall and, and the restaurants is, is very hard won and they don't want to lose it. Um, what, you know, with respect to what you've said about protecting against outbreak, have you seen uh, a second wave or additional cases of COVID-19 as your traffic and business resumes? And how do you deal with that both operationally and in terms of communications? Have you had any new cases? Uh, we don't. Thank God. Stuart, yeah, how about in your facilities? Yeah, no, we're the same, Sarah. And, and again, uh, I think, you know, we're all uh, heavily knocking on wood in, in the background. Um, you know, at this point, to Fanny's point, it's been a number of days now within any locally transmitted cases here in Shanghai. Um, and so it is very much a hard won success that, uh, you know, that the community, the government are all keen to ensure uh, is sustained. And so in that regard, uh, you know, there is that sort of continued vigilance that takes place. Uh, your comment about uh, public transit is certainly valid. Uh, you know, it, it took only days for the infamous uh, Shanghai traffic jam to reemerge. Um, <laughs> but subway traffic at the moment, you know, is still only about 70% where it was last year. 
Um, and so people are returning, um, but some of those, you know, final steps are, are, you know, will take a little bit more time for people just to get used to, um, but we're certainly on the right path. And, and I think you're describing it as hard one. It's exactly right. Now, um, you, the uh, question came through and it actually, it kind of relates to, you know, what's the impact of this crisis on uh, progress on the environment. And the specific question is, have you noted a shift in consumers purchasing single serve water bottles versus the bigger jugs, such as, you know, a couple liters or four liter jugs. Um, and, and, and this may, you know, this may speak to any other things that you see in your facilities around how people are acting differently uh, post crisis. Mm. I must say, it seems to me, um, the formal wear definitely will be one of the hardest hit, as I say, uh, mm -hmm. because people, uh, this is one thing, and all sports-related uh, facilities, they're in great demand, uh, including going to the gym or taking up private lessons. Uh, I think people, they become a lot more health conscious. Uh, even by the time when they go out to eat, uh, they tend to order more vegetable uh, and uh Quite a lot of people, they are actually on diet. So because, uh, actually, yeah, you may say because they, I seen that everybody looks uh, quite fit. Uh, and then they are not really, uh, I think they must be uh, exercising uh, a lot more and then eat, eating less because everybody knowing that we must remain healthy. Otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, we, we will be in trouble. Well, and I know we've heard from some of our uh, members that deal with online sales in China that uh, sales of supplements and, and health products have really uh, done very well. So in our last couple of minutes, I'm, I'm just going to ask each of you to make a comment. Um, uh, so here in Canada, at least in Ontario, our cases have stayed pretty steady recently at 300 to 400 new cases a day, rather than falling to zero like in China or in many other countries. Uh, what, in your opinion, is necessary to get those those cases down? Wearing masks. Wearing masks. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart. Yeah. Look, I I, I would uh, I'd agree, and, and again, you know, attach the caveat that uh, that I am no epidemiologist uh, in this exercise, but I think. Uh, you know, what we've seen uh, in terms of driving success over here in China, equally in, in South Korea in particular, is that combination of, you know, empathetic mask use, uh, heavy testing of the broader population to, you know, catch those people who are asymptomatic. Um, and then, you know, the sort of contact tracing uh, exercise to ensure that you're able to, um, you know, put people into home quarantine or isolation. Uh, to the extent that they are infected or have been in contact with somebody that's infected. Uh, you know, it, it's taken a lot of hard work, a lot of community engagement, but uh, that seems to have been the recipe over here. So, uh, you know, hopefully some iteration of, of that will, uh, you know, help to wrestle this thing to the ground in Canada and, and beyond. Great. Well, thank you. I, and we're just about out of time. Actually, one last question has come in. Let me just ask this. Um, are there any particular industries or stores in your facilities that have prospered specifically as a result of the changes that have been put in place? I would say the health club. Health clubs. Yeah, okay. Actually, I can see that uh, even some of the health club operator, uh, they are interested to expand. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would say the all the health related uh, trade. Uh, I think uh, it should be uh, one of the, uh, you know, enjoying the prospect. Okay. Any final thoughts, Stuart? Yeah, look, I think health is one. I think as a broader theme, what we've also found is that, you know, through a crisis like this, it sort of accelerates existing trends. Um, and so groups that have been incredibly effective at integrating their online and offline sales offerings and customer experience uh, have really, uh, you know, come through this, you know, quite strong and, and are in growth mode. So we've actually had a number of prospective tenants approach us saying, look, we know your catchment area. We have a tremendous, you know, membership that's built up through COVID that we have been doing, you know, home deliveries for, for example. Mm. Uh, and now we want to expand in your property to provide them with, you know, a bricks and mortar experience. 
Very interesting. Well, this has been a, a, a very insightful conversation. Uh, I'd like to ask our audience to join me in giving a virtual round of applause to both Fanny and Stuart. Um, thanks so much to both of you for sharing your insights today. Um, we're grateful to China Mobile International in, here in Canada for sponsoring today's webinar. And I'd like to welcome Helena Howe, who's Business Development Director, to wrap things up. Helena? Thank you, Sarah. Uh, hello, everyone. Nice to meet you here. Uh, reopen right is very important to all of us and uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Fanny and the store for sharing, uh, sharing their experience in China to help Canadian organizations reopen in a safe way and we can help here. Uh, here in Canada, uh, we are offering an excellent solution called Thermal Camera Screen. This solution was widely used in China to assist to stop the spread of COVID-19 when businesses re reopened. It's a very high, uh, it's high efficiency way to stop the uh, COVID-19. Uh, this fever screen system can be installed in multiple entrances of office buildings, shopping centers, public transit hubs, schools, and factories. The thermal cameras can detect parcels temperature in real time with multiple targets. If someone's temperature exceeds the standard range, the camera will alarm and also identify the particular person with abnormal temperature. This is a contactless, multiple targets, real time, accurate, and easy to use. We have a number of different solutions to offer and based on clients' needs. As you know, China Mobile is a telecom company here in Canada. We also provide international internet private line. We have our own submarine communications cables to make a global network between Canada and China and around the world. For an example, for a Canadian company with branch office in China, we can provide them with dedicated global internet to have the best of quality communication. We also have mCloud to manage all the cloud service. Uh, we are the partner with AWS, Google, Microsoft, and Alibaba. We provide a total solution for ICT project, including structure cabling, telephony system, Wi-Fi setup and the data center build up as well. In a word, we are a total telecom solution provider to serve you based, uh, both in Canada and China. Please let us know if you need our service. Thank you all and thank you CCBC for giving us this opportunity. Thank you, Helena. And I think we're going to turn it over to Edward to wrap up. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you. Uh, once again, thank you, Fanny and Stuart, for your frontline uh, market intel and hands-on advice. I uh, wish your property uh, have uh, a great people traffic in the forthcoming shopping festival in China. Um, now, Helena, uh, we would like to express our uh, sincere gratitude to China Mobile International um, for the great support. Thank you. Now, to all members and friends today, um, thank you all for your participation, and we hope that you all have uh, an informative and interesting time with us. Um, and this is the first session of CCBC's Practical Tool Webinar Series. And there will be more sessions uh, revolving around um, the subject like uh, the Anhui, the two sessions, um, education opportunities, uh, and supply chain, supply chain challenges uh, during COVID-19 down the road. So stay tuned and look forward to seeing you again in our next session. Thank you. Uh, have a, a nice day and have a good evening.